Okay, hello everyone. <clears throat> Welcome back for another edition. Uh, this is the last lecture that's going to be prep for quizzes because we have the last one on next Friday, which is Black Friday. <clears throat> Not a holiday. You can do some shopping, but we still have a quiz. Uh, then we have sort of two more weeks of stuff and then there's the exam. So let's get into today's stuff. We want to finish off 19th century things and then after that, maybe things will start becoming more familiar to you, um, more stuff that you've probably heard of or are related to something even that you've experienced in your daily life. Uh, most of these things are sort of um, out of date, but you can see how everything in this class is very closely related to um, uh, how our life has developed, what things look like, and how we think all of these ideas are very important. So if you really want to know how uh, American culture works, then you have to put the whole puzzle together piece by piece. So here's another bunch of pieces. We're going to talk about the Gilded Age. As I said, there's a lot of different parts to the end of the 19th century. America starts to transform, you might say. Um, everybody finished their contradiction stuff. Thank you for handing that in. That was due yesterday. And uh, that's sort of one way of characterizing American culture. That's why I had you do that assignment is that um, America, some people call it the, some people have called it uh, the two headed giant. So it's like a very powerful, um, fantastical creature, like a giant, but it's got two heads. It's always fighting with itself. Um, one of the great contradictions is America is supposed to be the, the leader of the free world, and yet they have a lot of people in jail. <clears throat> and it's supposed to be the developed, one of the most developed countries in the world uh, in many different ways. But you can point out um, in, in many certain places of America, it's not developed. So you can easily live off grid. One of the easiest places in the world to live off grid is in the, the mountains of Western America. If you live in Montana or Colorado or another remote part of the United States, you can probably find a place which is not connected to electricity um, or a sewer or power uh, in any way, right? You're going to be able to live off the grid, disconnected from the rest of society. Um, but anyway, all those things aside, uh, America is a highly developed country and uh, it's very diverse, but it often ends up having at least two heads. It, in, in politics, obviously, we have the two great parties always contending with each other. Uh, as I pointed out, the Democrats in the Civil War are the ones that are uh, pro-slavery and the, the party that <clears throat> really is... Um, occupies the position that the Republicans often do these days. And there's different types of Republicans. They're not completely unified. There's a struggle within the Republican Party right now between Donald Trump and uh, the people that support him and the people are, uh, who are against him. And we don't know how that's going to play out. Uh, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. The, the long history of the United States, almost 250 years now, uh, there has been usually two parties um, contending. Since George Washington retired and Thomas Jefferson and John Madison and Alexander Hamilton were against each other, there's been kind of factional politics and only two parties have really been in the, in the mix the whole time. Uh, only two parties have ever, ever won. No other independent party uh, has been able to take control. So you've got a two-party system, as they call it. But as I told you, in the Constitution, there was not supposed to be parties at all. Originally, there was uh, the president and the vice president ran on separate tickets. Like I said, you imagine there was a Republican president and a Democrat vice president. That, doesn't, that just doesn't work. So after George Washington retired, and it happened that Thomas Jefferson was the vice president, the next election, they, f they fixed that for the next selection, uh, election, and uh, the vice president ran on the ticket with the, the president, so they, they run together. Now, <clears throat> all of these things, all of these things were disrupted. Everything was disrupted by the Civil War in the 1860s. 
And afterwards, I explained about the reconstruction, how the South was destroyed and then occupied by the Northern military and, um, you know, the, the Southern military apparatus and economic social apparatus was dismantled. They supervised that dismantling. So um, there's a, there was already an advantage for people living in the North economically, but the North gets even wealthier because this, winning the Civil War doesn't just mean that they are in control of the country uh, and they gradually allow the South back in, you know, state by state as they ratify the new constitution, the amendment to the constitution, which um, ratifies the the Emancipation Proclamation as uh, I think it's the 15th Amendment, if I'm not mistaken. I should look that up. <clears throat> Don't want to make a mistake on that. The rights of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. That, that was the one. That was the right one. The 15th Amendment. Um, before they rejoined the United States from the Confederacy, which had rebelled and separated and started the Civil War, each state had, a ratif had to ratify that 15th Amendment and recognize that. We did talk in class quite a bit about this who, who decides, you know, uh, on certain issues. A lot of students were interested in that, um, probably because in your country, there isn't really much power in the province uh, like there is in Canada. Provincial power is quite strong in Canada too. But in the States, as I said, uh, state legislature and state governors have a lot of power. But one of the reasons that the federal government has more control is because they have the money. They have control over financial and economic policy. And when when uh, projects or programs are launched by individual states, most states can't do that without support from the federal government. That's really the underlying glue of the system, I think, is that most states can't do it alone. There are exceptions to that. For example, uh, New York, especially, New York, uh, Texas, and um, California. Those, they have huge economies and huge populations and they can, their governors have a lot of influence on national politics for one thing. Uh, you might even throw Florida in there as well, but they don't, they're not as um, significant. Um, and they, they're, it's not as rich for, for one thing. Florida has the, the fourth biggest population. I believe it's California followed by Texas followed by Florida is third. And I'm not even sure if New York is actually the fourth in terms of population, but the influence that they have um, and their ability to, to um, make policy and support themselves because they're what they call, we call have states, right? Um, there's a have not states and the have states. And the same thing is true in Canada. So there are rich states and there are poor states. I mentioned a few of them, Kentucky, uh, Mississippi, Missouri. Uh, I have a student who lived in Missouri. These are some of the, the poorest states. And when you go there, um, you'll see a big difference between, for example, New York and Kentucky. Very different culture, very different level of prosperity, um, very different attitude about politics. Uh, a, a totally different culture, if you want to look at it that way. I, there's a book that I used to, uh, as a reference for writing my own textbook, um, it's called um, American Nations, and it splits uh, North America into seven different nations based on traditional things like geographical boundaries. Like I said, if you look at Europe, Europe has so many countries. Um, a lot, some of them are kind of artificial, but a lot of them are very logical. You can just look at, you can just look at France and say, okay, it's got natural geographical boundaries. It has oceans and rivers and mountains as its edges. Same thing with Spain. It's got a chunk out of it in Portugal, but that makes sense too. Italy um, used to be split into pieces and there's a mountain range that goes right down the middle of Sicily. So you got southern Italy and then you have Sicily, right? And then you have northern Italy, which is in the Po Valley. And then you have the Swiss Alps, which is a different country. So these things are kind of naturally natural boundaries. And you have the same thing in the United States. You have like the Midwest uh, and you have the, the South Desert that's kind of 
more influenced by Mexico, we can call that whole area the, the Te Tejanos, which is the origin of the name Texas. And then you've got like the West Coast culture, uh, Northern California, all the way up to Seattle um, in Washington state. And of course you have New England, which it has its own style. And you've got uh, the South, right? From Virginia down to Florida. And then you have the mountain range, the Appalachian Mountains, which includes Kentucky and West Virginia and Tennessee. Um, and and those all of those places have like similarities between their, their cultures. You have the Mississippi Valley, all of the states that are along the Mississippi River. They're all sort of in the same condition, economically, politically, uh, in terms of their population and usually even their ethnic, you know, balances, how many African Americans or Mexican Americans or Asian Americans or, or um, Anglo Americans they have. So <clears throat> that's the way America looks, right? Um, that's the way it's developed. And uh, somehow, like I said, it's kind of surprising that America is an actual country, but it is roughly the size of the EU. And if the EU becomes actually one country with a whole bunch of states, you know, rather than nations um, separate, it's kind of a union, as you know, that's what we call it. But they also called America in the Civil War, they called it the Union, right? The American Union. So there's some, some similarities, some parallels. If you're European, you might be able to see them. Okay, so the, what does the Gilded Age mean? Gilded means covered in gold. It looks like it's gold but it's just gold paint, right? Or, or gold sort of covering, like it might be beaten gold, but it's very thin uh, if it's not paint. Um, you just put something and cover it in a very thin layer of gold. So it looks like it's solid gold, but it's not. You pick it up and be like, oh, this is not that heavy, unless you make it of, of lead, and then it's pretty heavy, but it looks like gold is the point, but it's not really gold. So if you look on the surface, you see gold. You look deeply, you look inside, Look at the, the whole thing, it's fake. So the reason they call it the Gilded Age because after the Civil War, things look good. America is still one country and we have these industrialists who are making tons of money and getting rich. People are immigrating from Europe by the thousands, right? Lots of Irish people, lots of Italian people, lots of German people coming. There's war in Europe, uh, the Franco-Prussian War happens in 1870, the Germans win that. They form their own country, officially unifying Germany, uh, making the German Empire in 1871. Uh, 1867, Canada becomes a country. We have our own confederation. Um, the, Alas the Alaskan Purchase, I believe, is also in 1867. I think it's the same year that Canada becomes a country. That's not a coincidence, I think. Um, once America buys Alaska, British North America is like, we better, you know, expand or America is going to connect um, itself from the middle, from the Mississippi Valley. They're going to connect up to Alaska. And imagine if that had happened. There, were, uh, there was a point where some people thought, like, I mean, there was an American-Mexican war um, and they took a huge part of Mexico, right? Mexico should have been much bigger. Uh, but once the United States took all of that northern Mexican um, area, in including Texas and California, the two most populous states, you imagine America without Texas and California, and imagine it belonged to Mexico, Mexico would probably be a stronger country if it had Texas and California as a part of its country. But anyway, those are counterfactuals. That didn't happen. What happened was they won against... As I explained, Davy Crockett died at the Alamo and they took the Texas Revolution happened. They separated, they had a war, uh, they occupied Me Mexico City. This is before the Civil War. So they added all this territory. Um, th this, is, this is going to drive a whole lot of optimism. America is getting bigger and bigger. The frontier is, is the frontier is moving rapidly west. This is going, going to affect the native people negatively in many, many ways. Um, can't underestimate that. The Monroe Doctrine, which means James Monroe reinforced what George Washington said in his farewell speech to the American people when he retired after his second term in office. He said that Europe um, always has is fighting. The history of Europe is a history of war. And that America should not 
um, get mixed up in European politics and European wars. We should remain neutral. Don't make alliances with anybody. This is kind of isolationist policy. And as you know, the United States is not isolationist. They're in everybody's business all the time. They're a, they're a hyper-interventionalist state now. They're projecting power and being involved in almost everything. Recently, they've kind of dialed it back a little bit. Donald Trump wanted to, to change that. And I, that's one of the only things I agreed with that Donald Trump was trying to withdraw. But it's very difficult to do once you're involved, right? Afghanistan was a disaster, uh, is a disaster, continues to be a disaster since um, the Americans left. They, they made it temporarily better, but in the long term, it's, it might be worse, which is crazy to say. But when I was in San Francisco this summer, a cab driver um, moved from Afghanistan uh, in like 1995. He's, so he's been in the uh, United States. He, his, his children are Afghani Americans. He has like five kids. I, it was a long drive, so I talked to him about this stuff because I he... He was asking me where I was from, and I said, oh, I'm from Korea. And he's like, well, you don't look Korean. And I said, I know, but my kids are Korean. They're speaking Korean in the back seat. Um, long story short, though, this is the kind of thing that we expect from the United States. There's a lot of fallout. Vietnam uh, is a good example of that. Iraq is a good example of that. When Donald Trump pulled people out of Turkey, there was a lot of violence, and the, the Kurdish people that were allied with the United States were kind of hung out to dry there and the Turkish military came in and um, did what that, whatever they wanted to. So all of these things, that's not what the United States was like, but they became like that because of the Spanish-American War. That was one of the things. One of the things about the Monroe Doctrine was just like, um, protect American interests, okay? It's isolationist, but if somebody is interfering with American stuff, then we have to do something about it immediately. Right. So the problem in the, the Spanish-American War was uh, Cuba, right? Cuba. Um, we say in English Cuba. There was there was a, it was controlled by Spain and there was a revolution in in Cuba and Spain sent soldiers, you know, thousands of soldiers to put down the rebellion. Cuba is very close to Florida and Florida was a part of Spain, too, 200 years ago. But the United States had bought Florida. So. At the end of the 19th century, in the 1890s, a lot of these things happen. Uh, the Monroe, Monroe Doctrine is from early 19th century. I'm going to say it's from 1820, about. But this is 1890. And I believe the oil rush happens just before. Just We talked about the gold rush, the California gold rush. It's around the same time, 1850. Uh, I said 1849, right, was uh, um, San Francisco, the, the California gold rush. And I can never forget that number because there's a football team called the 49ers. So you can't forget that one. Segregation is after um, Reconstruction. So we're talking about, you know, after, in the 1880s, essentially, when, when the soldiers leave and they start to roll back all of the progressive changes and 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 they they start basically breaking constitutional law segregation is is um, a policy of separating people by race it's like apartheid from south africa um it's it, it's similar in that sense it it happens slowly step by step it's not really enforced it's just a a, a general policy of denying people access, and this is not allowed, right? Uh, this gives people disadvantages. Uh, eventually, segregation will be undone, un un unwound and made illegal, but not until 1965, right? Martin Luther King Jr. doesn't, uh, Rosa Parks doesn't happen until 1950, so it takes almost 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation. It's crazy the, that Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, and a hundred years later, um, the descendants of those slaves are going to poor quality schools and going in separate bathrooms, sitting in separate parts of restaurants, not being able to be in the same train as white people. They have to sit in separate parts of the bus. That's what segregation is. It's, it's a horrible, unfair policy. 
And that's why the civil rights movement happens. We'll talk about it when we talk about 20th century stuff. But just to give a preview, I mean, African Americans fight in World War II against the Imperial Japan and the Nazi military. And they fight and they die just like everybody else, but they're in their own units. There's white units and black units and they're treated differently. And they fight and, and give up their lives for the ideals of American life, American culture, America as a country. They believe in it and they fight and they die. Some, some of them die and some of them survive. And the, the survivors come back and they say, what? why are we doing this when look at what what we're living with back home right when we're in the field when we're fighting and sacrificing our lives we're doing the same thing that these uh, other parts of um society are doing the white soldiers are doing the same we're doing the same thing as them right we can't we can't be generals we can't be officers we don't um, get to eat the same food or intermingle and we don't get the same you know treatment on the battlefield and we do our jobs just as well and we come back and we're treated as second class citizens that's not what it says in the constitution it doesn't say all all people are treated equal except some people are second class people or lesser people that's not what it says never said that again that's the greatest contradiction so the segregation policy this is a this is looking at the cracks in the goal right looks like everybody's doing well if you come to america and you look at all the huge houses in Rhode, Rhode Island and New Haven, Connecticut. Like I said, most of you are like, what's Connecticut? It's a bunch of rich people that live not far from New York City. Like New York is here and Delaware is here and Connecticut's here and Rhode Island's here. So lots of people who are really wealthy, they have big houses and you know, they have businesses in New York or they work in New York, but they have a huge house in Connecticut or Rhode Island because um, it's nice there. It's beautiful and it's all rich people, so they like it. Um, if you go there, you think uh, Amer all Americans are rich. Same thing in California. If you, you go certain parts of California, like Beverly Hills or whatever, you think everybody in America has got a $20 million mansion, but they don't. You know, that's a small gilded surface that you're looking at. So we have these Rockefellers, Andrew Carnegie's, right? I explained this in another class, so I'm sorry for those of you who listened to me say this in composition three, I think it was. But I mean, they're good stories. They're, these guys are interesting people. And I didn't write about these individuals because we're gonna run out of time to talk about all of these things. But John D. Rockefeller is an oil tycoon. Um, he's the richest man in American history. Um, he was a Sunday school teacher. Um, but he was he was an innovator. He was a businessman. He was not a scientist um, or an inventor like Edison or Benjamin Franklin. We're talking about a person who has business sense. Um, he has a genius for business, for organization, and for competitiveness. And he basically um, gradually absorbs every part of the oil industry from top to bottom and left to right. Integrated, horizontal, and vertical supply chains. So he pretty much own, he owns the whole process from the oil drilling right up to uh, the pumps and the delivery carts. Like he's, this guy lived a long time ago. So 19th century, there's no cars. They're like, they've got oil tanks on carts and horses are, you, you gotta remember, like what time we're talking about here. It's the 19th century. Nobody's driving cars yet. Henry Ford didn't make the Model T yet. So everybody's still, if you're rich, you're riding horses or you're riding trains, right? The trains are, are still largely, you know, steam engine, but there, there's combustion engines being created. So things are gonna change, but he's, he's, back, he's basically delivering as he develops his business and the car industry gets going. Um, he's, de he's originally de delivering oil, making oil, oil deliveries on horseback. And they have big tanks on carts, and then they pump, pump the oil in. So, as I said, it was whale oil that was the fuel they used for lamps, like what we call an illuminant, right? Um, this, comes from, this comes from French, from Latin, right? Allume, to um, illumine, to illuminate, means to make it bright. So the, the fuel is called an illuminant. It's not a, it's not a gasoline or 
propane or something like that. It's a fuel for making light. So the lamp oil starts being Rockefeller's business. Uh, instead of thousands of whales being killed, which this is a good thing for the whales, obviously, bad thing for the air, but good thing for the, the whales, conservation, um, probably, I mean, definitely, if we hadn't have found that kind of oil and continued to hunt the whales, we would have killed all of them. So that's, he saved the whales inadvertently, but um, basically he was one of those people, he was intentionally going for a monopoly. So eventually, the story about Rockefeller, it's important that eventually um, the antitrust, it's mo mostly Theodore Roosevelt, uh, who starts this movement of breaking up companies that are dominating the market. And um, if you believe in capitalism, it also requires a free market. If you have one company that controls 95% of the market, they can set the price wherever they want and they can mani manipulate the, the market, which what might be bad for the consumer on one hand, but it might be bad for national security. Like if you need oil for your ships or for your vehicles or for your tanks or whatever it is, and uh, you have somebody in your country who can literally sell the price cheaply or expensively, depending on how they feel on the given day, um, this is a huge concern for the American government, not just for people who are driving their cars to work or driving their, using oil for fun as, you know, not for fun as burning it, but going on a trip or going on a vacation. The oil becomes the fundamental, you know, uh, element, as you know, We've had inflation problems this year. Most of that is because of uh, disruption of fuels and oil and gas from Russia. Um, this has destabilized the supply chain and everything needs to be moved. And everything is moved still, mostly by using oil. So when oil price goes up, the price of everything goes up. That's really the rule, has been the rule. So Rockefeller's company was sued by an antitrust suit and he lost and his company um, broke up into Exxon and Imperial Oil and a few other ones. I think the original company was called Standard Oil because it set the standard, right? Anyway, he was still d disgustingly rich, so it's okay. He doesn't need to be, we don't need to feel sorry for him, um, but it's a lesson to be learned that uh, if you if you want to have a healthy, you know, consumer um, capitalist market and you don't want things to be manipulated and you don't want the, the um, gap to open up too much between the super rich and the average person, the poor and the average person, the middle class person, um, then you need to, there has to be some regulation. There needs to be some rules. Um, we still haven't learned that apparently because we give tax breaks to super rich people. They don't, they don't, um, if they're a CEO, they don't take salaries because they don't want to pay the tax. They just, you know, um, invest a lot of money and get capital, pay small amounts of tax, corporate tax and capital gains tax, which is lower than the tax rate that the average person pays. So like I said, on the surface, things look good. The oil rush, you know, fuels this massive increase of productivity. Carnegie is a steel tycoon and you got Vanderbilt, it's like shipping and transportation. I said before, Stanford, the guy that the university is named after. Um, there's a huge cigarette company, tobacco company called Duke. The guy's name is Duke and that's the university in North Carolina called Duke. He, it's a typical thing for a super rich American, thing, um, American person to do is make tons of money and destroy other companies and dominate the market and maybe be unfair and super competitive. And then as a sort of cleaning up act to improve their reputation, build a whole bunch of museums and libraries and hospitals and schools and found a university that's named after them. Carnegie Mellon is a university in the United States. I think it's in New York. Um, Carnegie's business was steel and he dominated the steel industry in the same way that Rockefeller dominated oil, second richest person in the in the period. Um, he was born in Scotland, and uh, when he he dominated the steel industry so much, uh, it's hard to imagine this happening. But 
you know, he, the amount of uh, material, just like the Industrial Revolution in England, he did the same thing with steel where he was producing, you know, uh, a certain amount. And then 20 years later, he's producing literally like 300 times as much. So the amount he could produce in one, one year, 20 years later, he's producing that amount in one day. That's the amount of increase we're talking about. It's exponential. So like he's doubling the amount of steel that he produces every six months, you know, uh, until like 20 years later, he's, he's, he's uh, producing all the steel in the United States for everything, for ships, for railroads, for skyscrapers, which is a new thing in the 19th century. These, they start building skyscrapers using steel and glass. Um, they don't exist, you know, before that. Uh, but he, he's, he's a great, Carnegie's just also an amazing, he's a genius, he has a genius for business. He was great at investing money. He always upgraded his equipment as fast as possible. And he just made piles of money. And when he retired, um, he built, I think he built a thousand libraries. Because the story is that his, fam his father was like a machine tool worker, like a factory worker. That's it in Scotland. And, and uh, so he grew up and he, I think he worked on the railroad first. And then he made his steel company because he's like, I know what I need to do. We're going to need a lot of steel. So I'm going to make a steel company. So, you know, he worked for a while, saved his money, made his own company, wait, went from just a regular guy who is a worker and, and just grew his company from this small company making steel and, and uh, improving steel making processes to one of the richest people in the world. It's a crazy story. Uh, another part of his story is that he, um, one of the, one of the people he worked for, maybe he was, uh, I, I think maybe he was actually in charge of the rail, one of the railroads, the Pacific, um, the Pacific Railroad or something, a very wealthy guy, very important guy. And he was working for him while he was working for him. Uh, he let him use his library. He let him read, um, from his private library because back then rich people, had huge libraries. Uh, Bill Gates has a massive library. Sometimes rich people still do that. But back then, there wasn't that many libraries. Like, there wasn't public libraries around. So, like, you know, Shakespeare also, supposedly, that's how he learned all about Greek and Roman and Latin and history, English histories, because he was a maybe... People, I mean, this, it's not clear exactly what he was doing, but it looks like he was uh, tutoring um, for some wealthy family, which was something an educated, you know, lower class person might do um, in in 16th century, because everything goes back to the 16th century. And uh, the something that you might do is is uh, work for somebody, and then you know he had access to the noble, the wealthy person's library. So this enabled him to become Shakespeare. Without the la that library, he could never have written. Hamlet or Macbeth or Troilus and Cressida or King Lear or The Tempest or anything else, right? Uh, he wouldn't have known about English history and he wouldn't have known um, all the things about Greek and um, Roman myths that were required for him to tell, you know, to make a play about Julius Caesar. Carnegie also felt that his education, his self-taught, his reading had supplemented his hard work and saving and intuition and enabled him to become uh, very successful. So when he retired, he built a thousand libraries in America, 1000. He had a lot of money. So I don't know if we should be super generous about that number, but that's a lot of libraries. Okay. So I think I've explained this, all of this stuff here, except maybe the, the conflict I said about the Spanish American war, this triggers the sort of defensive response of the United States. They, they go to the, they, they start negotiating, telling Spain to back off. And Spain says, no, this is our island. Uh, it's our business, stay out of it. So there's an intervention and the American military goes there. There's, there's an American steamer that explodes and they accuse Spain of hitting it with a, a bomb or a torpedo or something like that. These are brand new kind of technologies at the time. But they have a steamship that's, that's uh, in, the, in the harbor and it, it explodes. But it's pretty clear now that it is actually an accident 
and that Spain didn't attack it, they're, why would they do that? They just said, stay out of our business. Why would they do something that would start America? So anyway, that incident provoked the United States and they were already agitated. They're already worried about Spain having this, all this you know, military presence at the island right beside Florida. So when the steamship exploded, American military went in. And um, there was a lot of debate about whether they, they, they won against Spain and then they fought against them in the Philippines. And that's how uh, the influence of the, the, the Spanish stopped in the Philippines and was switched over to the United States, which will have a lot of consequences later because the Philippines is um, closer to Asia than it is to the United States. Um, and the United States decided that they didn't want, and this is another basically racist policy, is that they didn't want Cuba to become a, a state. And they didn't want the Philippines to either. So they kept control of them, sort of, but over like, sort of like a overlordship and didn't give them an official state status. Because if they did, they'd have to do the same thing that they did for all American citizens. They would have to let them vote. But what's the problem with that? Well, there are, Cubans are largely African of African descent. It's a black. It's a people that are mostly black. So darker skinned people. So they didn't want to absorb a state that was ninety five percent ethnically different. Um, the same thing with the Philippines. They just didn't want a whole bunch of, you know, Southeast Asian people um, running perhaps. The Philippines could be multiple states, and then what would you do? How would you run a country then if you had people that weren't speaking English and they didn't look like you and they didn't share your values? So they rejected that idea that they wouldn't make them into states. And this creates a lot of problems down the road. Um, the relationship between America and Philippines is, I think they generally like each other now, but the, the government certainly I think the Philippine, the Philippines government, the Filipino government, has a lot of um, undealt with issues with the way that America has treated them over the years. Uh, obviously, um, they fought in World War II. They both were kind of attacked. They fought with Japan, and Japan took over the Philippines, and America came back and freed them again, and they became a country. So there's a lot of mixed feelings there. It's very complicated. But in general, um, this this, poli this policy, the Monroe Doctrine kind of uh, collapses, and the Spanish-American War triggers this. Some people in America think because the frontier is closed, the edge of America is closed, is that now we're a big country. We should be every other powerful country, Russia, Germany, France, even Belgium, they all have colonies. They all are, are imperial powers, right? Every powerful country in the world has is, is got colonies overseas and the United States doesn't. So what do they have to do to become one of the elite countries, join the club, become a superpower? They need their overseas territories. So the Spanish-American um, War, uh, it's not 1890, I think it's 1895. But this, this is not a coincidence, I think, that they finish fighting within their own territory. So they immediately start fighting off continental America. Um, despite what George Washington warned about, the United States gradually gets involved in every continent's um, politics and military conflicts step by step until they're in everywhere in the world. Um, you can really see that the British Empire does this at the end of the 19th century. Britain's already done this. They're overextended. They're all over the world. The British Empire has been in over, I think there's only 20 countries in the world which has not had a British military or um, presence at some point. That's ridiculous. And America's, I got, the number must be similar for America by this point. Uh, there's very few countries in the world that haven't had, at one point or another, an Amer American army group um, presence, um, garrison, or, or air force, or navy presence. Almost no countries in the world have not um, seen the American military. That's, we'll talk about that later, too, because that, that's, a, that's a big topic. So 
this is a kind of turning point. It's like, are they going to pe become this um, expansionist, right? There is limits. Of course, they are not really an empire, but sometimes they behave like one, even though they're a republic. It's, a, it's just like the Roman Republic, right? The Roman Republic, it was a republic, but for, for most of the famous part of the Roman Republic, before it became an empire, there's an expansion. Rome is a republic, but they're taking over countries, right? They fight against Carthage and they, they expand over the entire Mediterranean eventually um, and becoming an empire. But for most of that expansion, uh, for the first four or 500 years of Rome's history, they're actually, they have a Senate and they have elections, right? And so does the United States. This is one of the things most people are afraid of, including me, is that is the, is the United States going to just turn into some sort of autocracy? Is it going to be, you know, some kind of dictatorship or imperial project? We, they have to be very careful. They're at the point where this could happen. That's why, you know, in the news, President Biden, which like or dislike him, he's super old, I know, but he's always talking about we got to protect democracy because... We've seen it happen a lot of times that um, once you get a very powerful country and powerful people in charge, it's easy for you to lose control. So they do sort of turn into this and they, they hesitate and they don't enter World War I until 1918. But um, the full transformation sort of takes place in World War II when America commits itself fully to fighting, you know, all over the world against two other superpowers. And that's when America, you know, decides that they're going to become a different type of country. Now, I haven't left myself enough time, I always do this. Um, the Native American people, they're very important <clears throat> um, for so many reasons. Obviously, the first thing is it's a, it's a, it's a tragedy. It's, uh, you might say it's kind of an unavoidable tragedy because as I said before, the, there's going to be, as technology and, and uh, states develop and civilization changes, there was going to be contact, right? We call this first contact. Um, usually now it's between aliens and human beings in science fiction movies. But this first contact is the first contact between human beings who live in Asia and human beings who live in the Americas. And they haven't had contact for over 10,000 years. So they've developed different societies. Um, some people estimate, some scientists, I shouldn't say some people, I keep saying that. I'm not trying to be vague here, but professors and scientists and, and archeologists and anthropologists are, make estimations that there could have been over 50 million, maybe 80 million people in the Americas uh, before Columbus came, which, you know, if you, if you look at how many native people were around uh, several hundred years later, from 1492 to, let's say, 1792, 300 years, right? The beginning of the, beginning of the 19th century, uh, when America becomes a country in 1776, the population has de decreased in North America by 90%, about. The biggest populations of natives were in what is now Mexico and in Peru, the Inca, right? Um, the South American population and the Mexican population were probably the majority of the people, that, but there was big civilizations in the Mississippi Valley that collapsed before we even got to see them because disease spread way ahead of the Europeans. So often they would come and all they would see is just the remains, the skeletons and the, the the toppled buildings or collapsed buildings and ruins, which decades before um, were, were completely wiped out by plague. Like I said, think about the Black Death, but nobody has any immunity at all, right? Think about a plague and like some people have resistance in Europe. So 50% of the people, more than 50% of the people survive, right? Cuts the population in half. But we're talking about multiple diseases, not just one, although the Black Death could have been multiple diseases. There's a theory about that, but never mind. There's smallpox and influenza and measles, and these things kill Europeans all the time. Um, so they're very dangerous, 
uh, but when they get to the native people, they, they just, they have no defense. Their, their bodies and their societies have no defense. They don't even know what's going on. They think it's sort of like some sort of, just like the Black Death, some, there might be some spiritual reason or some punishment or some, you know, uh, other explanation. They don't have, you know, medical science. So they don't know what the reason is for this, but it just kills most of them. George Vancouver, uh, who was a British guy who sailed around the ocean and came to the western part of Canada, and he came into English Bay, which is the site of modern day Vancouver. That's why it's named Vancouver after him. And when he came there, there was a huge um, complex uh, society of chains of villages in Western British Columbia, and that um, which occupied English Bay because Vancouver is beautiful. It's perfect space for somebody to have a village for fishing and for growing crops and for building things and just majestic appearance like all all one way is the mountains the other way is the ocean and there's a river inlet and nice place um, to relax and enjoy nature beautiful place and uh, all there was was just abandoned you know villages all along there he didn't find uh, any you know he was just finding remnants of a civilization that existed and by the time he got there there was nothing left so this is the condition <clears throat> during the 19th century, because the population has collapsed, the, <clears throat> and because Americans really, all of, everybody wants more territory, more land, there's more, there's pressure, population pressure on the East Coast, pushing everybody West. <clears throat> when they go, the oil, the oil rush and the gold rush are, you know, specific points of tragedy within this greater tragedy, which is because when they, they would make a treaty and say, okay, that one of the famous places is in the Dakotas, North Dakota, South Dakota, those are named after tribes, right? Massachusetts is named after tribes. Delaware, Delaware were a native tribe. The state of Delaware, where Joe Biden is from, it's named the Delaware River. That, that, those were famous natives. And they were warriors and they were, um, they had, great qualities, right? So many of them were honest and, and uh, dealt with the English fairly, and all it got them was their land taken away and their way of life destroyed. So the Lakota, the Dakota, um, they're Sioux people. Most of these tribes, like I said, the Iroquois are five groups. One of them is the Mohawk. And uh, there's a college in my university city of Hamilton. McMaster University is where I went to university, but there's a college called Mohawk College. It's named after many, many places in America are named after the native people that lived there. So North Dakota and South Dakota, they're Sioux people. And they're very famous for riding horses. And it's an interesting thing because there were no horses in America. Horses died out thousands of years ago. So the native people didn't have horses until the Spanish came and they brought horses and some of the horses ran away. Apparently this is true. I find it fascinating that this would happen, but some of these horses ran away and became wild. They became, you know, what do they call them? Mustangs. That's why, again, um, I mean, this all this stuff, uh, when you see a name, it's always got a reason for it, right? Um, Mustangs are wild horses, and they, these mustangs are ran, run around, and then the native people caught them and, and retrained them, re-domesticated them, learned how to ride them, and shoot their bows from horseback, which enabled them to follow the buffalo and be more efficient at killing. So by the time, it's the 19th century, this is hundreds of years, this is how fast human evolution and adaptation happens. They meet the Sioux, the Americans are meeting these Sioux people, and they're amazing like trick riders. They can like stand and shoot arrows. They can shoot arrows between their legs like Mongolians can. Do crazy stuff on the horses. Um, they're, they're just like expert riders. And 300 years ago, the Sioux had no horses. It's amazing. Anyway, that's what they're famous for. The Sioux are warriors on horses, but actually they, they became this group called the Sioux, which was composed of many different tribes because all the tribes were getting picked off one by one by the American military and by American settlers. 
So they banded together and there's the Black Hills in Dakota and they discovered gold, which is in the reservation. It's within the area that was given to the natives, right? They keep saying, you, know, you can have this land, you can have this land, you can have this side of the, if you're on the west side of the Mississippi, that's all native land. And then they find gold in California and they go across the Mississippi and they go right through all kinds of native villages and they have no idea who these people are, right? And the natives are, of course, there's like wagons and wagons and hundreds and hundreds of people. And like you're in a village of 200 people and you've never seen that many people. Like just wagons and wagons and endless numbers of white people crossing right through your territory where you live trampling everything and going right through the Oregon Trail, through the mountains to California. This happens throughout the 19th century, right? Um, one of the, 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 the war with the Sioux is one of the, the great Native American, American wars, American Indian wars, right? Um, the Sioux fight against the biggest, the most famous battle is the one called Little Bighorn where a famous um, general, Cust Colonel, Colonel? Colonel Custer, it's called Custer's Last Stand. It's a very romanticized story, but he's a tall American guy with long blonde hair and like a big hat. He's almost, he looks like, he looks like a Confederate general. Um, <coughs> he looks like a general from the South. Um, but he's, he's a tall guy with, and he's very arrogant and he, he really wants to, he missed most of, He's basically an inactive soldier and he wants battle. He wants to be a hero. And so he finds out that there's a, this group of Sioux warriors encamped um, in Little Bighorn. It's called Little Bighorn. And uh, he, he attacks quickly because he wants glory. He wants to win a battle, become famous, and he wants to be promoted. He wants to be a general. I believe he's a colonel. Anyway, he has a, I think he has a hundreds of men, but there's actually, they're out, he doesn't know it, but they're outnumbered like four or five to one because all of the tribes have gathered together and they have about 2,000 Sioux warriors and um, they ambush him. And they, um, he has two other um, subordinates and they're supposed to attack in three columns. And one of the guys is drunk and the other guy is, I think, afraid. So it ends up kind of being Custer fighting with about 100 men, 150 men, fighting against a 1,000 Sioux, um, and they, they massacre them. And then these 2,000 warriors, because it requires a lot of food and a lot of support to keep them together, they, they disband, they scatter, um, also to avoid fighting an even bigger American army that's gonna come after Custer is killed and his men are, are sacrificed. But this becomes an excuse for the American military to attack unprovoked, to attack all native people, because one group resists. The Apache are the last, they are the last group to resist. Um, the famous chief is Geronimo. And uh, Americans have this expression called going off the reservation, which means to go crazy or, or do something very brash. And that's because Geronimo was the last chief of, chief of the Apache to leave the reservation and and uh, escape and go off into the desert and you know kill people and live sort of, of a free, uh, unrestricted um, native lifestyle. Um, they hunt they hunt them down. The way that they catch the Apache is by using other Apache. They actually can't catch them because they're so good at hiding and tracking and stuff. The only way that they can get Geronimo is to use other Apache to find those Apache because the, the American military can't, can't track them, can't, they're not good enough. Um, the Navajo are a tribe that live near the Apache that are very famous because during World War II, um, the Navajo were used as, uh, to send messages because the Navajo language is very distinct and uh, the Japanese were trying to listen to American radio communication and um, so rather than creating their own code, they just had the Navajo talk to each other in their own language. And the, the I mean, the J Japanese had no way to, it's not similar to any other language in the world. It's not even similar to other Native American um, languages. So these Navajo guys were the radio 
signalers in the American military and the Japanese Pacific theater. And uh, there's a movie about that called Wind Talkers because um, that's their nick their nickname is Wind Talkers. And uh, they would transfer information by radio. Um, and even if it got intercepted by the Japanese and they were listening, they wouldn't be able to understand the Navajo. Algonquin, Algonquin are the guys that were friends with the French, guys and girls. Uh, they taught the French how to make maple syrup. So there's other things that are important about the Algonquin, like these guys are enemies. So Iroquois, the Iroquois nations make friends with the British and the Algonquins make friends with the French and they, they're allies. So, you know, I said it's the Seven Years War, but in, in America, it's called, <coughs> that's actually called the American Indian War. Because a lot of the war is fought between Algonquin and Iroquois as much as it is, as it is between the French and the, and the Americans, uh, the French and the British rather, right? So that's, that's the war that was um, 1756 to 1763. So yes, like I said, when the French lost, the Algonquin people, um, that was a very serious disadvantage for them um, because where I'm from, Ontario, that was largely the territory. North of those big lakes, we call them the Great Lakes in Canada, north of that was Algonquin territory, south of it was Iroquois. So the Iroquois nations were mostly um, lined up below Lake Ontario. If you look at the American-Canadian border, the Canadian side was Algonquin. We have a park called Algonquin Park, which is my favorite place in the world. Uh, it's, it's a gigantic provincial park. And if you ever go to Canada and you like camping, go to Algonquin Park, okay? I promise you, you you'll see a beautiful natural environment that is breathtaking. Yeah, the Sioux, okay, the Cherokee, they're the ones that in the textbook, they're the ones from Georgia that are evicted from Georgia by Andrew Jackson um, because Andrew Jackson was a lunatic and he hated a lot of people. He was racist for sure. Um, I don't mind saying that that's my own point of view, but if you knew about President Jackson, uh, I mean, he did good things and bad things just like every president, but these kind of things are inexcusable. Uh, he did kill as many Native people as he could, and he wanted, I mean, he, he was a military, he was more of a general than he was a president. When he was a president, he was a very dangerous man. Um, so Andrew Jackson did that, and it's called the Trail of Tears, because they force-marched all of these Cherokee people, even though the Cherokee had their own newspaper, and, you know, they made their own, they, they made written language to do their own newspaper, and they tried to become, like, they tried to adapt to American culture, they were the ones that had the, showed the biggest, I don't know, what do you say, likelihood of assimilation. They were the most likely, most successful at, at kind of becoming more American than any other tribe and accepting that. And yet they were the ones that were forced to, you know, march to another territory far away um, from Georgia, across the Mississippi, I believe. And it was, if I'm not mistaken, it was also winter. Many of them died. On the, on the journey. And they, they took their, all of their land away because people in Georgia wanted to build uh, and develop it. Arawak were the people that Christopher Columbus met. And that's the list. I know there's many, many tribes that I've missed, and, um, but I just can't talk about them all. So I just tried to take you know, a, a few famous ones that I know about and I could explain. I, I know there's um, specific tribes that deserve more recognition. So you got to remember, there's literally hundreds of these tribes. And these are some of the biggest, you know, most representative ones, most famous ones. I just picked them. Not, not even that they're representative, but that I know their, their individual stories a little bit um, in some detail. So those are the ones that you can read in the textbook. All right. And then we'll stop there for today. I know that was a long lecture. Thank you for listening. Um, I'll see you on Friday.